Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أتل ما أوحي إليك من الكتاب وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما يصنعون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد In the world of culinary arts or cooking you'll notice that when preparing foods the foods that we prepare most of them they are composed of main ingredients and then there are side ingredients. And the difference between these two types of ingredients is quite obvious. The main ingredients cannot be substituted. The side ingredients you can substitute with certain foods. It might not make a difference what kind of vegetables you put in. But there are certain foods that require main ingredients. One of the main ingredients, one of the oldest, most ubiquitous types of ingredients or seasonings is salt. With most foods, if you don't put that pinch of salt in the food, right, the food becomes very hard to consume. It's bland. And it becomes very difficult to consume. In our life, as Muslims, the main ingredient of a healthy and productive Muslim lifestyle is prayers, a salah. If we look at the concept of prayers, if we look at a salah, it is undoubtedly the most important aspect, the most important religious obligation in our lives. And we know there's an abundance, a plethora of of a hadith. We have verses in the Quran and we have the narrations of the Prophet and the Ahmad Bayt, peace be upon them, that express the significance of prayers. We've all probably memorized the hadith that says that as salat amud al-deen, prayers is the pillar of faith. Now the job of a pillar is to establish a foundation, any structure, any building, has a foundation. The job of the foundation or the job of the walls of a, pill, of, of a structure are, is to hold this, the, the structure together, to hold the ceiling up. Without the walls, without the foundation, the structure cannot stand erect. And so the foundation is very important. The hadith says, as salat deen It is the pillar, it is the foundation of all of faith. Not just for Muslims, even for other religions. The Holy Prophet, 
Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam In regards to prayers he says Hiya min hajul anbiya It is one of the most integral parts of every prophet and every messenger's mission When the prophets and the messengers they would address their communities an integral part of their mission and their objective, their teachings, was in regards to prayers. And Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, the sixth Imam, he says, وَهِيَ آخِرُ وَصَايَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Not only during their lives did they encourage their communities to pray and to establish prayers, but even on their deathbeds. It was their last will, it was the last will and testament of the prophets, of the messengers, of the imams. If we read the history of the Ahl bayt we'll notice that many of them, during their final moments, this was their last will. They would emphasize on the significance of prayers, of as salah When Imam Ali alayhi salam was to describe the holy prophet, peace be upon him, he would say that this prophet, who was always with the companions, always with the people, helping the people, helping the companions, you know, attending to their needs, their desires. This Prophet who was always with the people, when it came time to prayers, this Prophet would be as if he had no other, he recognized no other relationship. He didn't know anyone anymore. The only thing that became a priority for him at that time was prayers was to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet himself, he says that prayers is the apple of my eye. It's the most beloved thing to me. In one hadith attributed to the Prophet, he says, لا أشبعوا من الصلاة For every desire, for every need that we have, when we're hungry, when we're thirsty, any other desire can be satisfied. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, my desire for prayers, my love for prayers, cannot be satiated, it cannot be quenched or satisfied. I am continuously in need and in desire of establishing prayers. There's so much emphasis. There's so much emphasis in our teachings regarding prayers, yet sometimes we notice that some people, they neglect prayers altogether. Some people live their lives and do not pay any importance to prayers whatsoever, whatsoever. Or perhaps this is the extreme case, perhaps there are some who they do pray, but when, we're, when they're praying, they're doing everything but praying. They're underestimating the significance of prayer. They might be delaying their prayers for other reasons. If we're at work or at school, sometimes, or we're doing something else, we're in a meeting, or whatever it may be. Sometimes we have the, we tend to delay our prayers because of whatever reason it may be. Sometimes we underestimate the significance of prayers. I remind myself before I remind you, brothers and sisters, many of us are guilty of this. Sometimes we stand to pray, and again, you know, we're doing everything but praying. It's mentioned that one day the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad that he entered into the masjid and he noticed that there was a man who was standing, he was praying and as he was praying he was, you know, he was playing with his beard, he was fidgeting playing with his beard, you know, fixing his clothes and so the Prophet, he turned to his companions and he said that had this person's heart, had this person's heart become khashya, humble, had his heart fully realized what he was doing while he was praying, his organs and his body would follow suit. If his heart finds khushu, realization of what he's doing, then his body will automatically follow suit. His body will also find khushu in prayers. And thus he's not going to be fidgeting around. He's not going to be thinking about everything and anything except 
what he should be thinking about during prayers. So why is it that we neglect prayers? Why is it that we underestimate the significance of prayers? There could be many factors. Tonight, I'd like to focus on two. The first reason I think why we underestimate prayers and the significance of prayers, brothers and sisters, is that ever since we were young, ever since we were kids, we have always been taught to ignore strangers, right? You notice that your parents, they tell us, when ever since we're young, at a young age, they tell us to ignore strangers, don't talk to strangers, don't get into a car with strangers, don't accompany a stranger. We're always taught to ignore strangers, and for some of us brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a complete stranger. And since we've been taught to ignore strangers, then we ignore this stranger also. And this is very unfortunate. If we examine the lifestyle of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt when it came to their relationship with God, when it came to their state of mind during prayers. It has been mentioned that Imams such as Al Imam Al Hassan when it, when it would be time for him to pray, he would go and he would perform the ablution, the wudu. And as he was preparing for prayer, while he was washing his body, his complexion would change. His complexion would change. He would stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, face the qibla, and his body would begin to tremble and shake. And when asked why, when the companions would ask the Imam, why are you shaking? Why are you trembling? He would reply to them, do you not know who I am standing before? I am standing before a majestic king. I am standing before the king of all kings. And so the Imam, he would realize what he's actually doing. Imagine, brothers and sisters, imagine that one day you were brought forth to stand before a king. Nowadays, I mean, we don't have too many kings and queens. But imagine that you're brought forth to stand before someone who's important, a very important person, a special person, right? There's a sense of awe when you're standing before, or a group of people, right? Imagine you're standing before a large crowd of people. They say that one of the biggest fears that people have is public speaking, right? They say that sometimes public speaking, the fear of public speaking is greater than the fear of snakes. I mean, I don't know about you know everyone else, but I fear snakes, right? And I think most people fear snakes, but it suggests that certain studies say that the fear of public speaking is greater than the fear of snakes. In fact, some people have even gone to the extreme to say that they fear public speaking more than they fear death. They would rather die than stand before a large crowd of people and, and speak. Why is that? Why is, that pe why is it that people in general, they fear public speaking? It's because everyone has their eyes on you. It's because everyone is watching your every move, except those that are asleep, of course. Otherwise, everyone's watching your every move. Everyone's listening to you. They're watching every detail. And so this causes a sense of anxiety or fear with some people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all things. I stand here before my dear brothers and sisters, and you see my outer appearance. You see me and you hear the things that I say, but you cannot necessarily tell what I'm thinking about or what I'm feeling deep within. You see the outer appearance and I see your outer appearance. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees not only our outer appearance, but everything that we conceal and hide deep within us. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all things. Allah sees all things. Allah hears all, all things. Allah is omniscient. He is aware of everything. Those things that we publicize and those things 
that we hold very deep within us, that no one else is aware of, our intentions, our deep feelings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of them. And thus, this should allow us to feel a state of awe, sometimes be anxious, because Allah is always watching us. You'll notice sometimes, brothers and sisters, that you're driving on the street, and you'll see a police officer on the other side of the street. Now, you might have someone that you're talking to, you might have the radio on, you might not have your seatbelt on, or whatever it may be, but as soon as you see this police officer, he could be far away on the other side of the street, immediately we fix everything, we correct everything. If you don't have your seatbelt on, you click your seatbelt, you turn off the radio, you tell your friend not to talk to you, you put your phone away, right? Because there's a cop that's on the other side, and there's a chance he might see you and pull you over and give you a ticket. Imagine if there was a cop that was with you all the time, from the time you left your house in the morning until you came back in the evening, this cop followed you everywhere. The way you drive would be very different if there was a police officer following you everywhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's following us everywhere. Allah is watching us at all times, not just when we're out of the home, but even when we're inside our homes, when we are in our bedrooms, when we are in public and private, He's always there, He's always watching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all things. However, at the same time that Allah is aware, and that this causes us to have a sense of anxiety and perhaps a sense of fear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also the most merciful and the most compassionate. Allah tells us in the Quran, He says, كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ That your Lord has obligated upon Himself, He has mandated upon Himself that He is compassionate, that He is merciful. He has made it wajib upon Himself to express mercy and to express compassion to the creation. If we look at the 99 names of Allah, I mentioned this. If we look at the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are many of them that speak of the mercy and compassion of Allah. If we look at the Quran, in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chose in the verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah chose two of His attributes, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, both of them which signify the mercy of Allah. To begin each and every chapter of the Qur'an, all of them except one, Surah al Allah could have chosen Al-Qawi, the powerful, Al-Ali, the high, the most powerful, you know, the, the, the mighty, the powerful Lord, the wise Lord, the knowledgeable Lord. He could have chosen any of these attributes, but instead Allah decided to choose these two, these two attributes that signify His mercy and His compassion. Showing us how compassionate of a Lord He is. Sometimes we grow up and we have this notion of Allah as being, you know, a, a, a Lord who is aggressive, who is violent, who is just waiting for us to slip so He can punish us. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran tells us, Allah is powerful. And Allah holds us accountable. He is stern in punishment, but at the same time, Allah is compassionate. He is merciful. He is the most compassionate and He is the most merciful. And so when we have such a merciful Lord, it becomes incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, to try to establish a relationship, to get to know this Lord. We spend so much time and so much effort getting to know, you know, our family members, our friends, our friends' friends, sometimes complete strangers, trying to get to know them. But when it comes to the most important being in our lives, when it comes to the most important personality in our lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Creator, sometimes we neglect this relationship. It's incumbent upon us to establish a relationship with Allah, to strengthen our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what we do, we begin to love God. And when we love God, we develop a sense of unconditional obedience, servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mentioned in, 
a story that during the time of the famous polymath Ibn Sina, Abyssina, who lived about a thousand years ago, it said that one day he was traveling in one of the remote parts of Khurasan, present day Mashhad. He was traveling there with his servant and he stopped in a remote village and decided to rest there. It was very cold during that time. So he was resting there. They were going to spend the night there. In the middle of the night, Ibn Sina, he became thirsty. So he woke, he began to call out to his servant, to call out to him to get him some water. And you know, during those times, you know, they didn't have fridges or bottled water. And it wasn't, you know, very simple. You know, they didn't have a bottled water on their nightstand right next to them. No, if they wanted water, they would have to, especially in remote towns and villages, they would have to get up, they would have to leave, go to the well and fetch the water. And it was a big deal. Especially when it was cold. So the servant, he was reluctant to get up. He didn't want to get up. It was cold outside. He was, you know, he was covered up in his blanket. He felt comfortable. It was the middle of the night. And so the servant made himself as if he's not hearing Ibn Sina call him. Ibn Sina kept calling him a second, third, fourth time, over and over until the servant reluctantly, you know, he got up, he went, he brought the water for his master and he gave it to him. Ibn Sina, he says that after this incident, I heard, I began to hear the adhan in that area. And I thought to myself, I said, SubhanAllah, this servant who has been with me for so many years, I've never hurt him, I've never abused him, he respects me, he loves me, I like him, he's a good guy. I've never bothered him, I've never done something wrong. This servant tonight, he favored his own comfort over mine. He decided that he wanted to stay in bed instead of going out and getting me my water. But this mu'adhan, this person who calls the adhan, he has woken up in the middle of the night. He has gone and performed the wudu in the freezing weather. He has left his comfortable bed and he has entered the masjid. He's gone up the minaret and he's calling people to come to worship Allah, to pray to Allah. And so he said, this is such a beautiful embodiment of love for Allah subhanahu when we develop a strong relationship with Allah, we become in love with Allah. And you know that when two individuals are in love with one another, they can't get enough of each other. They can't let go of one another. They become attached to one another. Imam Hussain he, he has beautiful words in this regard when he says, تَرَكْتُ الْخَلْقَ قُرًّا فِي هَوَاكَ Speaking to Allah, he says, my Lord, I have left everything, the entire creation, I have neglected it for your love. تَرَكْتُ الْخَلْقَ طُرًّا فِي هَوَاكَ وَأَيْتَمْتُ الْعِيَالَ لِكَيْ أَرَاكَ And I have subjected my children to become orphans. They will not have a father. For what? For what reason? For you, O Allah. For your love. فَلَوْ قَطَّعْتَنِي فِي الْحُبِّ إِرْبًا لَمَا حَنَّ الْفُؤَادُ إِلَى سِوَاكَ And even if the swords would come and cut me into small pieces for your love, even so, my heart would not turn to any other being other than you. This is unconditional love. This is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our Master Imam Hussein alayhi salam portrays. It's incumbent upon us to get to know Allah. So Allah is not a stranger to us anymore. So this is the first reason. The second reason, brothers and sisters, why sometimes we tend to neglect prayers and not give prayers its due significance and importance is that we are not establishing prayers. What does that mean? If we examine the Quran, the Quran tells us Every time you look at the concept of as-salah, when it's mentioned in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correlates it or connects it with the issue or the, the concept of iqamah, establishment. 
So Allah says, أَقِلُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish prayers. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ Those who establish prayers. And there's a difference between praying and establishing prayers. What's the difference? What is the significance of establishing prayers? Establishing prayers means that prayers is not just a set of actions. It's not just some utterances, some words that we utter and some physical actions that we perform. It's not just ritual, but that there is value, there is meaning, and there is essence to the prayers. There's essence to these words. There's essence to these physical actions and this physical ritual that we are performing. It's not valueless. There are many ahadith that speak about the complete valueless nature of some obligations. When some obligations, some wajibat, some actions are completely valueless. They have no value and they have no worth whatsoever. Let's look at the example of fasting. Fasting, we know that one of the objectives of fasting is that, or one of the requirements of fasting is that we abstain from eating and drinking. This is what most people know, right? In order to fast, we have to abstain from eating and drinking and a few other things from dawn until nighttime, until after sunset. But fasting, in addition to this, the essence of fasting is not only that we do not consume food and water, but that we do not listen to that which we're not supposed to listen to. We don't look at that which we're not supposed to look at. We do not say that which we are not supposed to say. This is the essence of fasting. Otherwise, otherwise, fasting, according to the hadith by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he says, How many people they fast, but they get nothing out of fasting except hunger and thirst. At the end of the day, they've accomplished nothing except becoming hungry and thirsty. And we, we've all probably heard the famous story during the time of the Prophet when the woman who was fasting, she was humiliating her neighbor or the person you know, uh, her servant or her neighbor. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he heard this woman humiliating this other woman. And so he commanded his companions to bring her food. And she told him, Ya Rasulullah, I'm fasting. And he told us when we fast, we're not supposed to eat and drink. He told her, yes, that's true. But in addition to not eating and drinking, you're not supposed to say things that you're not supposed to say. That defeats the purpose of fasting. The essence of fasting is that it's a complete state of mind where you're abstaining from doing things that in other cases, at other times, are completely lawful. Eating, as long as it's halal, is completely lawful. There's nothing wrong with it. Drinking, is not, there's nothing wrong with it. The objective is to avoid these things which at other times are completely lawful in order to give us the ability to strengthen our willpower so that we can stand in the face of committing haram. So if I'm already committing haram, if I'm humiliating my neighbor, if I'm saying things and looking at things and hearing things that I'm not supposed to do, it defeats the purpose of fast. The same goes with Hajj. During the time of our sixth Imam, and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, one day he was sitting with one of his companions in a masjid al-haram, and they were witnessing the people performing the lawaf. And so one of the, compa the companions that was sitting with the Imam, he became excited, he told him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this is so beautiful, look at the amount of hujjaj, those who are performing the hajj. Look at their large numbers. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he said, Ma akthar al-tajij wa aqal al-hajij. There's, look, yes, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of commotion, but in reality, not all of these people are truly performing hajj. When my hajj is for other reasons, when I go to Hajj and I'm constantly complaining, oh, the food wasn't that great, we didn't stay at the best hotel, you know, there's smog and there's pollution and these, these people, they don't have good akhlaq and I wasn't able to get my booking the way I wanted to do and I got sick and I got ill and I did this and that and this happened to me and that. When I'm complaining or when I'm going 
for other reasons so that when I come back everyone says, MashaAllah, look at Hajj Fulan, look at Hajj Fulan. They're here, they've performed the Hajj. If this is the reason why I perform Hajj, then I'm not benefiting myself. The only thing that I'm doing is getting squeezed in tawaf, not getting to wear my favorite clothes and not putting deodorant and cologne and getting a few pebbles on my head during the Ibrahim. Otherwise, there's no benefit in my Hajj. The same goes with prayers. Prayers, it's ritual. There are actions, there are things that we say, but there's an essence. There is a value for these things. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to. Allah tells us that the philosophy of prayers, Allah says, in the salata tanha an al fahsha'i wal munka. Prayers is supposed to act as an agent which restrains us from committing shameful and evil acts. It's supposed to stop us from committing haram. And how many people they pray, they might pray five times a day, but yet they still commit haram. Is there a problem with prayers? Is there something wrong with the methodology? Is it outdated? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to develop something more modern, something more efficient? No. The problem is not with the prayers itself. The problem is with us who are performing the prayers. We're not doing it correctly. We're not performing the prayers in the way that we are supposed to. How does prayers stop us from committing shameful acts? If prayers are done consistently, number one, if they're done all the time and on time, if I'm not just praying when I feel like praying, when I have time to pray, or when things are going smoothly, or other way around, when I'm, you know, I'm in fear because, you know, I need a job, I've lost my job, or I lost, you know, a loved one, or I'm going through a rough time, and so I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept my du'as, and so, you know, it's time to pray. Or during the month of Ramadan, the beard comes out, and I begin to pray. Or during Muharram, or Ashura, or Laylatul Qadr, or whatever it may be. That's all excellent, that's all good. But for prayers to have a positive effect, it has to be consistent. It has to be done consistently. Number one and number two, conscientiously. We have to realize, we have to understand what we're doing when we're praying. That it's not just, you know, an exercise. Brothers and sisters, there are much better physical exercises that we can perform at the gym. It's not a matter of, you know, the ruku' and the sujood as being a good exercise for me. There's essence, I have to understand what I'm doing. When I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I say Allahu Akbar, I begin with takbiratul ahram. What does this signify? What does this signify? When I raise my hands and I bring them up here and I bring them back down. What is this? The books of narration tell us that this act means that we are putting everything behind us. Allahu Akbar. We are putting everything behind us and now we're only focusing on prayers. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I say this about myself. Sometimes it feels like it's the exact opposite. That I'm putting everything in front of me except God. I'm putting God behind me and everything else in front of me during prayers. When I say Allahu Akbar, when I utter these words, the takbir that we constantly say and suggests, when I utter this word, Allahu Akbar, and I'm putting everything behind me. And I'm saying that Allah is absolute greatness. He is greater than anything. Allah cannot be compared to anything, any object. He is absolute greatness. And Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam in regards to this, Imam al-Baqir says, As-salat tathbeetun lil-ikhlas wa tanzihun an al-kibar. One of the benefits of prayers is that it enhances one's sincerity and it strips a person's character from arrogance, from pride. When I say Allahu Akbar, I remember the glory and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Brothers and sisters, each and every one of us has a potential Fir'aun in us, deep down within. And if the conditions are right, 
with the right push of buttons, each and every one of us has the potential to become the most arrogant individual. Allah tells us in the Quran, Allah says, Inna insana layatga. In certain cases, the human being can be the most arrogant. The most arrogant. Yes, the extreme case is that of Fir'aun during the time of Prophet Musa. Fir'aun, it was not enough for him to be rich. It was not enough to be, for him to be the most powerful. But he was oppressive. What was wrong with him? Did he have too little money? Was he poor? Was Fir'aun ugly? What was his problem? I mean, he could have been ugly, I don't know. But his problem was that he was arrogant. That it was not enough for him to be the most powerful and to put everyone, to allow everyone be, to be placed beneath him. But he even went to the point to consider himself God. I am your greatest Lord, submit to me, worship me, obey me. That was his problem. He reached a level of arrogance. And arrogance, brothers and sisters, is one of the most, one of the deadliest spiritual viruses that we can catch. It's said in the books of Hadith that Iblis, Shaitan, that for 4,000 years, Iblis used to teach the angels of the heavens, the inhabitants of the heavens, for 4,000 years he would teach them, he would guide them, he was higher than them in their ranks. But because of one act of arrogance, because when Allah commanded the inhabitants of the heavens to prostrate before Adam, Iblis said no. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him why, he told him, why did you not submit when I asked you to? He said, Qala ana khayrun min. I am better than he is. You created me from clay, from dirt. You created me from fire. And you created him from clay or dirt. And fire is better than clay. So why, why should I submit to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, because of this act of ignorance, you have to leave. You have to leave. That's it. It's unacceptable. It's suggested in the books of Hadith that one day Iblis, he approached one of the Prophets of Allah and he told him, listen, I think it's time for me to seek forgiveness. I've been a bad boy. I've done all the wrong things. I've caused a lot of chaos. I've misled a lot of people. It's time for me to seek forgiveness. And since you're a Prophet, you have such a high position in the eyes of Allah, tell me, what do I do? You know, maybe, you know, you can use your connections with Allah to do, you know, to help me out. So this Prophet, he raises his hands and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah, Iblis is here and he's ready to seek forgiveness. He wants to be a good person. What should he do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told the Prophet, he told him, tell Iblis that if he wants to seek repentance and he wants me to forgive him, let him go to the grave of Prophet Adam السلام, and let him perform sujood by the grave of Prophet Adam. The Prophet told him, please, and please, he, he scoffed, he began to laugh. He said, you know, when I was in heaven and when Adam السلام, was, was doing great, he was alive, he was well, everything was fine, I never prostrated for him. Now that he's six feet under, I'm expected to prostrate before him? Never. Arrogance, brothers and sisters, is the deadliest disease. When I say Allahu Akbar, I remind myself of the greatness of my Lord and I also remind myself of my true value as a human being, my true weakness as a human being. Allah says, Allahu alladhi khalaqakum min dhaf. Our essence as human beings is weakness. When you see a newborn child, a child that's still born, just born, the child is completely dependent on others. He or she cannot do anything alone, anything, absolutely anything. If you leave that child, God forbid, if you leave that child for a few days without taking care of the child, the child won't survive. He is in complete need of others. And then slowly begins to grow up and progress and gain strength. Allah says, Allah alladhi khalaqakum. 
He gave you strength after this weakness. We reach a peak, we keep gaining strength until we reach a peak. After that, what happens? Do we keep going up? No, it's a slope and it's a sleep, it's a steep downhill slope that we go down. Allah says, ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ قُوَّةٍ ضَعْفًا وَشَيْبًا After this sense of strength or state of strength, once again we resume to a state of weakness, frailty, old age, where some people are not able to take care of them once again, themselves. They need the care and help of others. And so this human being who starts off with weakness and ends up in weakness, this human being which a tiny virus which cannot be seen by the naked eye can come and put you in bed for an entire week. This human being who is this weak, what's the reason for this human being to express arrogance and pride? For what? It reminds us of our true self. When we begin to recite the verses of the Quran, when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah in the very first sentence of the Qur'an, in the very first verse of the Qur'an, He reminds us to thank Him for His blessings and favors. He reminds us that He is the source of provision. He reminds us that He is the source of all of our favors. And He reminds us that we have to thank Him. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we tend to take our blessings for granted, in many cases. Again, I say this about myself, and I remind myself, before you, my dear brothers and sisters, there's so much that we take for granted. So much. It said that one day a man was asleep and he saw in his dream that he reached, you know, he, he, he went, he ascended to the heavens and he reached, you know, somewhere where he thought was heaven. And so when he reached there, he was sent an angel as a guide. You know, it's a new place, it's a big place, you could get lost. So he needed a, a tour guide. And so this angel came and accompanied this man to show him around. So he says, he took him to this big hall with a narrow corridor. And he went down this really long and narrow corridor with this angel and they reached the first door and they opened the door and he noticed this huge hall and it was filled with angels and they were scrambling around, they were really, really busy. You know, going from left to right, a very busy place. So this man, he asked the angel, he says, you know, what's going on here? He says, this is the room in which we receive the people's needs and their supplications. This is where the angels, they take care, they receive the supplications and the needs of the people, their prayers. And so the angels are very busy, you know, responding to the calls of, of people. So he says, we walked out of this room and we continued going. And we reached another, down the hall, we reached another room. We opened the door and we noticed again, once again, a huge hall. And it was filled with angels and they were busy running around and everything. And so he told him, he asked this angel, he told him, what's going on here? He said, this is the packaging and delivery room. The angels here, they're busy, they're packaging, you know, packing the, the needs and the supplications and the answers of those who pray, and they're, they're getting ready to send them off, you know, to ship them off. And so this is packaging and delivery. He says, okay, they left. They kept walking down until they reached another door. He opened it, he saw a small room with an angel, poor angel sitting alone in the middle on his chair, doing nothing, you know, drinking his tea. And so he said, he asked, he said, you know, what's this room? He said, this is the room of acknowledgments. Brothers and sisters, we love supplicating and prayer, praying. No one says, I've never asked Allah for anything. We constantly ask Allah for things. But not everyone has the courage and the reason to acknowledge when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us our blessings. When Allah favors us, when Allah gives us 
those things that we ask for. And sometimes, in many cases, Allah is giving us those things that we don't even ask for. Many things that we are unaware of. Allah provides for us, not too many people end up acknowledging, not too many people end up saying, thank you Allah. Thank you, Alhamdulillah, Shukranillah, thank you for providing me. Brothers and sisters, there are many things we take for granted. Many things. To the point where we live in a state in which we have first world problems. You guys know what I'm talking about? There are problems that are specifically first world. You don't find them anywhere else. Like people who complain, you know, they're asked to go and to babysit their friends, kids, and they go there and they have to spend a couple of hours there and they complain that they didn't have a good time there because the kids didn't know the Wi-Fi password. And so for a couple of hours they didn't have an internet connection. Or the person who's bought $400 Beats by Dre, you know, headphones, but has to unfortunately return them to the store because they make their ears too hot. Or the person, for instance, who doesn't have enough chips for their dip and they're reluctant on opening another bag of chips because if they do, then they're not going to have enough dip for their chips. Brothers and sisters, you know the United Nations World Food Program says that on average, 2.6 million children die every single year because of undernutrition. If you break that down, if you do the math, that's an average of 7,123 kids a day die because they have nothing to eat, because they're hungry. We have been blessed, brothers and sisters. And we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. Prayers provides us with an opportunity to thank Allah. To take time away from our busy lives, from our busy schedules to say Alhamdulillah. To say thank, thank you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If done correctly, brothers and sisters, consistently, conscientiously, prayers will have a positive effect on us. Prayers will allow us, it will allow us to refrain from committing acts of immorality and evil and shameful acts. It will. On the condition that it's done the right way. On the day of Ashura, there were two camps. There was the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there was the camp of Umar ibn Sa'd. And on that day, everyone prayed, brothers and sisters. Everyone prayed. When it became time for prayers, they all stood up and prayed. Umar ibn Sa'd, he stood with his army of 30,000 men. They stood and they prayed. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he stood with his companions and they prayed. They all prayed. But which prayer was beneficial and for which group? Did the prayers of Umar ibn Sa'd and his army, did it stop them from killing the grandson of the Prophet? No, it did not. No, it did not. Because it was ritual. Because they were playing, they were praying. However, we notice the prayers of Imam Hussein and his companions, Allahu Akbar. What a prayer. It allowed them to reach the highest of heights, brothers and sisters. The Arba'in, the Arba'in time is the time when the captives when Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam and the women and children who were captured by the army of Ibn Ziyad when they returned from Sham, when they were left. And they began to return towards the city of Medina, towards the city of their grandfather. And they asked the person who was taking them back to stop by in the land of Karbala on their way to Medina. Allahu Akbar. As they were returning towards Karbala, the Ahadith, they tell us that one of the great companions, Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, he relates, he says that I went to perform the ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and the companions on the Arba'in. It was initiated from back then, it started with a small group of people, with Jabir. 
with Jabir may the peace of Allah be upon him, with his companion Atiyah, with others, and then followed by an Imam Zayn al Abideen and a Sayyidah Zaynab and the women and the children, it began in small numbers, and now we have tens of millions of people performing the ziyar of al -Bain. He says, you know, Jabir was an old man. He had become weak, he was blind, and so Atiyah, he takes Jabir, Jabir tells him, please take me towards the grave of my master, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Atiyah holds the hand of Jabir. He takes him to where Imam Hussain is buried. He sits there, he's walking barefoot. He sits there by the grave of Imam Hussain. He begins to weep. He begins to cry and cry until Jabir falls unconscious. He falls unconscious. Atiyah says, I went and I took some water and I began to spray it on the face of Jabir ibn Abdullah. And then he awoke once again. Once he awoke, he yelled, he said, Ya Hussein, my dear Hussein, oh Hussein. He began to yell, Ya Hussein. And then he turned and he said, Habib, la yujib, Habib. My beloved Hussein, my master, I am calling out for you. But you are not answering my call. You are not answering my call. And the reason why you are not answering my call is because you have been killed. It's because your head has been severed. It's because your head has been re removed from your body. It has been separated from your body. Allahu Akbar. At this, as Jabir was performing the ziyara atiyah, he says, I noticed that a group of people were approaching where we are from far. I told Jabir, Jabir, he told me, go out and see, seek who these people are. He says, I went and I rode ahead and I noticed that it was Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. I noticed that it was the family, the Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet that were coming towards us. I rode back towards Jabir and I told him, Qum ya Jabir, wastaqbil haram Allah wa haram Rasulullah. Stand up Jabir, prepare yourself to welcome the family of Rasulullah. This is the Imam, Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. These are the women, this is a Sayyidah Zaynab and the rest of the women and children. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he stands up and he walks towards where Imam Zayn al-Abideen is. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he approaches and then he begins to he begins to speak to Jabir. He begins to complain to Jabir. He tells him, Ya Jabir, ha huna, wallah, qutila rijaluna. Oh Jabir, this is the place where our men were killed. This is the place where our men, their heads were severed. This is the place where the Ahlul Bayt were massacred. This is the place where the women and the children, they were taken captive. This is the place where the women were beaten. Allahu Akbar. This is the place where we experienced the tragedy of Ashura. The Ahadith, they say that Imam Zayn al-Abideen and the Ahlul Bayt, they stayed in Karbala mourning for about three days and then they turned towards the city of Medina. They returned towards the city of Medina. Bishr ibn Hadlam, the messenger, he says that I raced in front of the Ahlul Bayt and I reached the city of Medina to proclaim to the entire city what happened. As I entered, as he entered the city of Medina, he began to shout out to the people. He told them, Ya Ahla Yathrib Oh, inhabitants of Medina, there is no reason for you to stay here in this city anymore because Al Hussein has been massacred, Imam Hussein has been killed, and this is where the entire inhabitants of Medina they came out mourning for Imam Hussein. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين سيدة فضل الدعاء Brothers and sisters, there are many people who are sick, many people who are ill. Some of them have cancer, brothers and sisters. There is a young man who is 19 years old who has been diagnosed with cancer. 
There are community members who have been diagnosed with cancer, other people who are sick. They have asked us to pray for them. Brothers and sisters, with these broken hearts, as we turn to Imam Hussein and remember Imam Hussein, let us raise our hands all together. Let us recite the, the verse five times all together and pray for them. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muttara idha da'amu wa yakshifu su. Amman yujibu al-muttara idha da'amu wa yakshifu su. أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله 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 اللهم شافي كل مريض لا سيما المرضى المنظورين اللهم شافهم بشفائك وداوهم بدوائك وعافهم من بلائك اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين في الدنيا وشفاعة الحسين في الآخرة وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات